Hi friends, this is Joe. This is, I don't know, episode 132, 133, somewhere around there of the Decahedron RPG podcast. Today we have a very special guest. That guest is Michael slash Merck the Meek of the Merck the Meek podcast. Hi Merck. Am I calling you Merck or am I calling you Michael? Doesn't matter. Michael's <laughs> fine. All right. Anyway, today we're getting together and we're doing a review of... 76 patrons which was was is i don't know it was published back like 44 years ago so i'm not sure of of the uh, verb to use there but it was a supplement for the original traveler rpg uh and like i just said it was published in 1980 by games designers workshop so in the traveler line they had um supplements which were things like this book a book of a whole bunch of characters there was like a little campaign setting called the spinward marches that was a uh, supplement there was charts and forms and library data all those were supplements and then they had another series that were called uh, adventures and just like it said they were adventures um, and then there was a little subset of there that were double adventures, which was one book with two shorter adventures. But anyway, this is 76 Patrons. It was designed by Lauren K. Wiseman. He did a lot of the Traveler stuff. Mark Miller is the, the main honcho for Traveler, but Lauren Wiseman was like second place. In fact, when uh, Steve Jackson licensed Traveler and did GURPS Traveler, it was Lauren Wiseman that he hired and not Mark Miller. Uh, I'm guessing because Mark Miller was busy. But anyway, uh, the credit said that he was assisted by Tim Brown, Mark Miller, and Josh Harshman. And there is no art, which I didn't mention anywhere in my list, but I should have because, oh, I love that there's no art. Hmm. <laughs> uh, just to tell you a little bit more about the book before we get started with the re review, there's, there's 48 pages. Uh, one of those is the table of contents. Uh, two of those are a little introductory introduction section in the beginning. Then there's 34 pages, which consists of 60 of the patrons. I'll talk about patrons in a second. And there are six more pages uh, containing 16 mercenary tickets. So the 76 patrons are the 60 normal patrons, if you will, and the 16 patrons that would hire you as a mercenary company to do uh, military type jobs. Um, and the index is two pages. So in Traveler Speak, a patron is an NPC that hires that hires the characters to do a job, or at least offers them a job. And of course, it's the character's uh, option to take or not. The D&D equivalent of the uh, old man in the shadows in the tavern that hires the adventurers to go do whatever. Uh, patron is the... <laughs> Uh, traveler word for it. So the patrons are all organized in a similar way. In essence, they're all um, campaign seeds, adventure seeds. And uh, I'm going to read one here. If you listened a couple episodes ago, it's the same one because I'm not going to go through the book and give you everything. Then you wouldn't want to buy the book. So uh, I'm going to read it. Uh, it's the first one from the book. Uh, it's number one. So they say that the patron itself is a noble or a playboy, uh, that the players don't require any special skills and they don't require any special equipment. And then each patron has a player information section. And the player information for this one says that the group is contacted by a newly married couple who decline to give their names but have reason to believe that their respective parents are not pleased with their union. They will pay 3,000 credits to each member of the group who will escort them safely to a planet beyond their parents' sphere of influence. So that's the information you would give to the, the players and they would decide to take the job or not. And then there's this other section, which is the referees information. Referees, traveler speak for GM. Um, and it has, well, it's, it's traveler only use six sided dice. So at most it will be six. A lot of times uh, the options are doubled up so you don't quite have six options. But the thought is, um, the referee's information is the what is really happening, right? You gave the players their information, but what, what's the truth? And uh, the introduction even says, you know, you can roll a die to decide or you can just read through them and pick the one you like the best. And in this case, the options are 
Number one is that the couple has overestimated their parents' reaction. No attempt is being made to have either one kidnapped or murdered. Naturally, in the course of normal interstellar voyage, a group this size, obviously traveling in fear of something, is bound to attract both official and unofficial attention. The second option is that agents of one family will attempt to kidnap the woman. The size of the kidnappers group should be adjusted by the referee according to the armament and abilities of the adventurers band. That little line there is that the size of the opposition should be adjusted based on the party is repeated over and over throughout this book. I almost wish they just said it in one spot in the beginning. But anyway, um, the third option is the same as number two, but the man is the, is the target of the kidnapping. Uh, number th four <laughs> is that agents of one family will attempt to have the woman killed. The referee should determine the size of the attacking band as in number two. Uh, number five is the same as four, but they're going to try to have the man killed. And number six is that both families will attempt to kill one of the couple and kidnap the other. Two independent groups should be created by the referee. Anyway, that's that's the idea. It's just a bunch of options, you know, the what's really happening um, to let you know how to run the adventure. I don't remember if it's always, but it feels like the it escalates. The first one's usually the milder one, and then as you go down the list towards six, then it kind of ramps up the tension, it seems. Would you I, agree? I, I agree completely. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and then just because they're kind of different, uh, the mercenary tickets, I have a sample one here. This is the very last one from the book. Uh, and this is ticket number 16 or the 76th patron. This says that it calls for a battalion size company and, uh, it's a striker type mission. The background is that increasing terrorist activities on E fate in the Regina subsector have caused the planetary government to request help from the planet, yeah, from the Imperium. Reluctant to commit army or marine assets, the Imperium has chosen to hire mercenary contingents to aid the local forces. And the mission is that 10 million credits is offered to a battalion sized unit to act as reinforcement and relief for the local units on Ifate. The unit will serve six months and then be relieved either by other mercenaries or by local units. So that's one of the sample mercenary tickets. Uh, just thought I should show you both. Anyway, if this is your first time seeing or listening to one of our uh, reviews, the way it works is I always invite your guests to do a review and each one of us goes through the three things we like and the three things that we don't like as much um, because no product is perfect, but we'll get to that disclaimer when we get to the, the dislikes. So, and I always let the guests go first. So. Michael, what was the thing, your number one thing on your like list? Oh, thanks. Well, the, the reason I was excited to do this in the first place was because the, the six options you have, the, the absolute versatility or variability that you could get with the adventures. So that was like one of the main things. Most of them have six results, like you were saying. Some could be three, so you, you do have a variation there. Um, some of those results could be extremely dramatic uh, and would lend itself to some very interesting situations I would be excited to see the players try to get out of. So that was neat. And plus, they're reusable. If you, you do one of those scenarios, you can file off the serial numbers, change the patron's name, change the circumstances a little bit, and you still have the same basic scenario. So it's very reusable. Does that count as one? Yeah, that counts, that counts All right. beautifully as one. Uh, and it ties in closely with mine, which mine, I said, it's exactly the level of detail I like. As you just saw, heard, whatever, <laughs> um, with the example one, it's enough to get my creative juices flowing. It's enough inspiration to get me going. And a lot of times when I'm reading through these, when I'm looking at the six options, I'm like, you know, pick a little from, from number one and a little from number two, make it neither quite what either one of those, but something in the middle, and you get this really neat adventure, and I don't feel it's cheating because it's 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 for inspiration, right? It's, yeah, and so um, I love it, and I like that it doesn't give you 
all the details. It lets you run with it, lets you fit it into your world, into your play style. It's not like buying, you know, those 1980s D&D modules with a cardboard cover where everything is laid out for you and um, you're not int intended to deviate, especially if it's a series, because then you're going to mess something up for the next one. And you have to do all this reading. You have to read through, you know, 48 pages of the adventure. No, this is just a seed and, and let you run with it. I love that. That was my number one. Yeah, and they make it explicit in the introduction. Like, use this how you see fit, change things as you need to. So, yeah, they're giving you permission from the start to do that. Yes. Yeah. So what's your number two, sir? Uh, the organization, I, I said. So you, you have the type of scenario. Uh, so like, like we did in the example, noble, comma, playboy. So you know who the patron is, more or less. Required skills and required equipment. So if your players don't match up, this probably isn't going to be one that they're going to be able to do unless they go get other help. So you can organize for that. I suppose it, I would have liked to see maybe like a risk rating on top of that. Some of them are like this one is escorting. I mean, I guess it could be risky because there could be murder that's going on. But some of them are like you are you're trying to start a war. So the, the scale of risk uh, varies a lot. But besides that, I think there's a lot of uh, good organization to latch on to to figure out what scenario you want to go for. Yeah, and actually I'll, I'll comment on that a bit. I, it's, I didn't talk about it when we talked about the, you know, the 48 pages and all that. But it's organized in such a way that um, the first section is if you have like two to six players, two to eight, I can't remember the number. Uh, the next section, yes, next section is if you have over nine players, and then there's a section is if you only have one player. So, yeah, it's organized that way. And then in the back of the book, I said there was an index. So the index goes by patron type. And the reason that works well is because in the book three of Traveler, there's a random encounter chart. And one of the encounters is patron. When you roll patron, you then roll type and the what types you're seeing there come up. So in the index, it lets you just look up by the type and find, you know, which ones are that. So if you're doing that, you can then go and find it. So yeah, I the organization is great. I did not put that on my list, but it was a it's I agree with you. It's a it's a good thing. My number two is the level of tie in to other G D W products, uh, other traveler products. So originally, this was going to be on my negative list, and the more I thought about it, I'm like, no, they really did it the right way, because it's a balancing act, right? If you're a person that never bought this other book that they're talking about, you're you're irritated. I, I don't know where they just said the the Regina subsector. I don't know what that is. I don't have that. Comes from a book called. Uh, the Spinward March Marches. Yeah, I don't have the Spinward Marches. Um, on the other hand, if you do have the Spinward Marches, you're like, what good is this if no one, if the other books don't reference it? So here they reference them, they use them, but clearly up front it says, and I don't know why it would, because these days you would really, you would feel that anyway. But maybe in 1980 it was a little different. But it gives you. Free permission, in fact, encourages you. It says, make it fit your world. And so, um, yeah, I thought that was good. That It's there if you have the products. And if you don't have the products, don't worry about it. Just run with it. Nothing is so detailed that it relies specifically on that planet or that subsector or whatever. Uh, so that was my number two. Yeah, I never felt like I needed to go get another book to to make it work. So, I, yeah, I agree. It is the right level of balance there, for sure. And your number three, sir? Well, my number three was going to be open-ended as well, but you kind of covered <laughs> that. So I did have a backup. Well, um, actually, you, we're, we're more than we are allowed to to repeat things because I always think that's, that's valuable because uh, if both people bring it up, that means it's really, you know, a common point, a commonality. And if, yeah, so I, I don't like shows where people have backup lists. 
Um, <laughs> because it, I think it gives a, a false impression. You know, these are the three things that impressed you. So, yeah, no, stick with the originals. Go with your open ended. Because it sounds like you're going to attack it from a different angle than I did anyway. Yeah, well, yeah, so I don't have any traveler experience. And I typically go with fantasy RPGs. So, um, having this, it, it gives enough detail. And I, my number four actually was like, it, it's evocative, and you do start to get a implied setting out of it as you're reading it. But it's open enough that you can make it what you want, or you could kind of go with the details that they've given you. This kind of ties back when with your last point too. So it it it's it gives you enough t- to start imagining and start building out what you want to do with it. And I yeah, I like it that way. So I don't know if this is a bad comparison, if this is like heresy for both Traveler <laughs> and Warhammer 40k, but the implied setting that I was getting reminded me a lot of like 40k and the fact that there's an empire and there's, you know, the faster the light travel it seems. But at the same time, maybe because it's the 80s, <laughs> you're writing in journals and, you know, you, people are using very low technology where, like, space marines have bolt pistols instead of, like, laser rifles, that type of stuff. So, I don't know. That's just a random. Well, actually, it's that way in Traveler, too. There is a laser pistol, but it requires a backpack. And, uh, okay, yeah, they're, Traveler is mostly, like, slug throwers, like a 9 millimeter or... A shotgun or whatever so it sounds like there's some coming up commonality there but my number three almost matches your number three exactly almost exactly which means not exactly <laughs> but it's close i said that although this is for traveler like that first one the one i read off there about the the newly married couple that wants to escape their family and their family might be after them there is no reason you couldn't run that in D D. Or in a 1920s, like, gangbusters era thing. All of the, not all of them, but most of these, the vast majority, I would even say, are not tied to that time and place. And you could easily pick this up and use it for D&D or any other game you wanted. Yeah, that's a very good point. I was thinking the same thing. All right. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so that was our likes. Now, like I say, no product is ever perfect, and... I, I always feel the need to to give this disclaimer. We're we're not we're not like being mean on any products, right? These are the three things that each of us just you know didn't didn't excite us as much as the other three points. Um, and yeah, a lot of people only do reviews on positive points. I I think it adds to give the pluses and the minuses. And again, it's all very subjective. There is nothing objectively you are an idiot if you like no of course not this is you know i i like the color green if you like the color blue better just means we have different favorite colors by the way green is my favorite color i was just trying to come up with a random color but you know this is just what each of us didn't like as much as the other stuff with that said michael what is your number one dislike not necessarily one ranked but you know the first thing you're going to tell us well first off green and blue are my favorite (laughs) colors but that doesn't matter (laughs) um quality so you you get a lot of times you get six choices the quality of those choices i think can vary greatly where some of them can be like red herrings and you your adventurers might be going down uh dead end paths or they're just flat out boring, like nothing happens out of the ordinary. You know, your, your shipment would be shipped just fine. And I guess that's great, they'll get paid, but there's n- no real adventure there unless you drum it up with other circumstances. So that that was some of it. Some of the, the entries uh, are just like, here's an arbitrary role to see if this thing happens or not. Uh, without allowing any input from your characters. I mean, you could always make that happen, but it, as it stands, what they say is just make this arbitrary role. At least that's how I read yeah, it. Yeah, like there was one where uh, they're looking for this guy who was uh, an anthropologist, I think he was, who was studying this uh, primitive planet, and it says roll eight or better each week to find him. 
without really mattering what they're doing. Yeah, I, I yeah, I get it. Yeah. I mean, if, if your characters have skills for tracking or something, I don't know if they have those in Traveler or not, but like if the characters have a creative idea, I think that should impact the role. I mean, you could always do that as the, the referee, but not by rules as written, I suppose. So, yeah. And some of them, it seems like the result is the characters will just be guaranteed to be captured, <laughs> uh, tried, and put in jail. So, I don't... I no chance to escape or anything like that or to you know to be able to make it without getting arrested it seems the first part of that was almost on my list about you know some of the options being really boring and at the same time i was going to say and some of the options are like these double cross things um and i'm not a big fan of the double cross thing you know oh the npc tries to screw you over type thing that's that's not my uh style but then the more i thought about it and this is the reason I didn't put on my list, is that, well, some jobs should really be, I need you to do this, and you do it, right? I mean, if every time you're you're adding complications, you know, then the players get weary. They're like, oh, what's really happening? What's, you know, and if every time you're, you're messing with them, then they're like, mm, they don't want to do any job because, um, yeah. So, and if nothing ever happens, right? So I, I think they actually, um, I won't say they strike a good balance because they're relying on a die roll to do the balance or it's up to you as a GM when you're picking the options to pick them. And those boring ones, the, you know, the normal thing might be okay if you're looking for a short little thing between bigger adventures. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I almost said that, but then I changed my mind. But the other bit about... Uh, about relying on die rolls, yeah, I would, I wouldn't run that that way. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, my number one on the dislike is, I would almost call this sixty patrons and ignore the whole mercenary tickets. But actually, that's exactly what I do. I've had this book since the eighties. Uh, I actually have two digital, I mean, two physical copies. I have the original one from the 80s and the digest size. I should have brought them here. Uh, and digest size and then uh, Far Future Enterprises did these reprints, which were big landscape formatted things with all the supplements of one book. Uh, and so I have that. Anyway, um, but the Mercenary, it's just an entirely different feel from the rest of the patrons. And I get it because Traveler Book 4 it's kind of the gray hawk of Traveler. If original Traveler came in three little black books, almost like the three little brown books of original D and D, and then book four in D and D was Gray Hawk, and book four for Traveler was Mercenary, where it tells you how to do these mercenary type adventures. And I, I get that maybe they wanted adventures for that type of campaign, but I felt if you're running that type of campaign maybe it should have its own book, its own supplement, and leave this for the more traditional Traveler campaigns. Um, yeah, I, it's like I said, it's a whole different feel. Like the one I showed, it didn't have any options. You know, it, it wasn't a player's information, and this is what's really happening. It's just, nope, here's something. And I, it, it doesn't match. I, I wish it would have just not been in this book and been its own book. That was my number one. That reminded me, some of the patrons kind of refer to some of the mercenary tickets and other patron uh, jobs as well. There's just a few of them, but I just thought I'd throw that out there too. All right. So what's your number two, sir? Okay. So number two, uh, I already said organization, but uh, I'm also going to say organization for some of the dislikes. <laughs> uh, some of the scenarios, even though it's divided into group size, it doesn't really matter what your group size is especially if you're matching the, the, you know, the, the opposition is supposed to match the strength of your players. You know, it doesn't matter how many players you have if it's going to be equal anyway. So I guess that's kind of nitpicky maybe, uh, but that's one of the things I had. <laughs> well, if it is nitpicky, I agree, because my number two says exactly, <laughs> number of players for each adventure seems arbitrary. 
And you said exactly what I was going to say about that. What's the point? If you're scaling it all anyway, remove that those divisions and just make them just make them what what they are. Um, and you, yeah. you're going to scale accordingly. The only one that might be different is maybe the solo player ones. But looking through them, I still was like, no, I could scale this and I could unscale this. So, yeah, no, I agree with you. And it's funny that we both even put that in the number two spot. So, yeah, great minds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess a little bit off of that as well. You mentioned solo player. At first, I thought it was going to be like solo. Like you would just, as the referee, you would be doing the scenarios on your own. I don't know if that was more, that probably wasn't as popular in the 80s to, to do that as it well, is now. Well, actually, but. Traveler, you can do a whole bunch solo just using the original three black books. So first of all, character creation is like a mini game in itself. Um, I'm sure you've heard that Traveler is a game where you can die during character creation. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so, I heard that from your podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Actually, if you mention Traveler, that's what like 98% of people is, oh, you die during character creation. Yeah. So, uh, there's that. Uh, when you get to the trade rules, there's all these. You could like set up a little, uh, you could play solo as a merchant going from planet to planet, trying to buy and sell things really easily and, you know, use all the random tables. Yeah, it's it's good for solo play like that. All right. Yeah, I, I might have to actually purchase the, uh, the original so, rule books then. Yeah, if you, there's a version on the um, uh, drive-thru called the facsimile edition. It's all three original uh, books and the physical copy i think was six dollars or ten dollars it's a good price uh, and the pdf is free legally free available it's the original okay. core books and they have all the errata and it's not the original it's actually, it's actually the 1980s print um the original was 1977 but they have all the errata there as well too so that's kind of cool but anyway we're getting off topic what is your number three dislike sir um i uh, so too open-ended maybe um in some cases, you have to come up with a lot of details for, uh, there's one where you're trying to infiltrate, is it like a, a moon or something where there's a, a rail gun or something that you can point at a planet and, or there's a, a lab facility where you're trying to get uh, a virus or something and you have to come up with all the details of how you're going to get in, what the layout is and all that. So... In, in some cases, I, I'm just not used to sci-fi adventures, so that was a little more daunting for me. Well, not only that, this is actually a comment I was going to make later, but I can make it now. Uh, not only that, if you read the introduction, I, this is what I would call like, like um, hardcore game mastering, um, like like uh, that TV show uh, Iron Chef only for, for game masters, right? Because when you read the introduction, they say, you know, pick the adventures, read the player's information to the players, and while they're making their play, plans, sketch out the buildings and the NPCs and everything that you're going to need for this adventure. Like right there at the table on the spot. I'm like, wow, that's hardcore. That's some improvising. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's not the way I do it. I pick one ahead of time and I use it for an adventure. Yeah, that makes a whole lot more sense. I think they did say that you could call for like a, a, a small break while <laughs> the players do their own thing while you're you're scrambling on ideas, I guess. Uh, yeah. So my number three was, and it's not surprising, so you, there's 60 of them and there's like four people working on it. There are some that are awfully close to some others especially if there's sort of like one in the the three player section and then when you look in the nine player section it's almost the same exact adventure and then there's a couple that are like the same setup but the options are a little different and um yeah i mean it's not a big deal but it's 76 patrons but now we're, we've reduced it down a little bit plus 16 of those are really mercenary tickets so not a huge deal, but I felt felt it was worth mentioning. Yeah, true. 
yeah, I, I remember coming across that. I, it's it almost I thought like they they had the same scenario but different player size yes. groups. But like we said, that that doesn't matter so much. So it is a little bit of duplication. Yes. All right. So we talked about what we liked. We talked about what we didn't like as much. Uh, overall, what's your your overall thoughts? I I still like it. I don't regret buying it or anything like that. Um, that, that sounds so <laughs> negative at the same time. It does, but you um, know, not every. Yeah. <laughs> even if you're a negative, I'm very positive on it. So don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, if I did more sci-fi adventures, I think I would be more excited for it. But I, I liked the concept of all the different options that you have per patron. Um, and I, I still like that. And I, I agree with you. I do think you could transfer this over to fantasy, to 1920s, to any other genre. So I, I will probably be referring to it again. I'm not just going to throw this away or, you know, never see it again. So is that better? <laughs> oh, it's, it's whatever you want it to be. So overall, would you say thumbs up, thumbs down? Yeah, I would say thumbs, thumbs up. up. All right. So thumbs up. My and I'm going to do a couple call outs. So my overall opinion. So first of all, I've said it before. I like, in fact, uh, episode I don't know single digits episode. James did an interview with me. And he said, "What's your favorite module?" And I said, "Does this count? Because this is it. If if it does." Um, and he said, no, it doesn't count. So I had to pick something else. So yeah, I love this. And I'll say right now, this is a huge thumbs up for me. Uh, like I said, the versatility, first of all, the just the little bits of inspiration, it, that's all I need. And when you give me more than that, I start to get annoyed because I'm like, that's not the way I would do it. And, uh, <laughs> so I love it. It's little bits of insp inspiration. Um, n number eight. I think it was number eight is the adventure I'm using for the actual play that we're uh, that will show up on this podcast someday. Um, number fifteen. Do, do you have your book handy? Yes, L I do. I'm I'm trying to mute because my girls are in the other room playing with Legos. <laughs> I don't know if the mic will pick them up or not. But uh, fifteen, yeah, no. you said. Fifteen. Play Playboy. Yes. All right. Uh, do you want me to read something? Uh, so. The name of the thing that they're trying to get. How would you pronounce that? Uh, uh, Terran Usonadolar? <laughs> Purple? Is that, that the thing you're talking the one. about? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and I was looking, I was like, but it seemed awfully specific. And then I looked at it, and this just made me chuckle, and I love things like this. So... Look at it again, and I'm going to say U.S. $1. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Yes, okay. <laughs> Collecting stamps. And it's P. Henry. That is an actual stamp. That is, <laughs> that is a Patrick Henry stamp from the 1950s. <laughs> mm, nice. It's a United States $1 stamp. And, yeah, I, that just made me chuckle. Okay. Um, yeah. Another thing that... <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, because I looked at that. I'm like, if they say Terran, I started to, I was going to Google it. And so I was yeah. looking at it to like split it up in my head to like remember how to spell it. I was like, US one, oh, US one dollar. Ha, 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 I get it. Anyway, um, the other thing that caught my attention was how many of these missions are just over the top illegal? Yes, yeah, and that's what I meant by like the risk rating, because you, you know you're like you're going against the empire here. You're you're gonna be in deep trouble if this thing goes south, and a lot of those options are going south. Yeah, well, there, there's one that called uh, the job is to assassinate the president of the planet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and. In some sense, that makes sense, I guess, because if you're looking for a legitimate job, you don't look for legitimate jobs hanging around in the city spaceports, right? So, uh, but on yes. the other hand, it seems to me that if I'm trying to assassinate the president of the planet, I'm not finding some rando dude in a bar. <laughs> but that, that's also true. But yes. it's what I call Hollywood logic, right? You you wave your hand a little bit to let the story happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the the Iron Man GMing, I already talked about that. That just stuck in my head a little bit. And oh, and I already talked about the double cross options. 
Um, there were a lot of double cross options. Actually, number six is almost always a double cross. Um, it wasn't in the example I gave, but yeah, number one is almost always everything happens exactly as it was presented. Number six is always they're trying to screw you over. They're they're framing you for assassinating the president, and so. Uh, yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah, a lot of them end with that, and it's up to the players to figure out how to escape from jail. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yes. Very but true. those are just things that stuck out in my mind. Neither they're positives or negatives, just things I wanted to talk about. Uh, but like I said, overall, a big thumbs up from me. So that's, for both of us, two thumbs up for 76 patrons. And that's all we had. I think this is the, might be the fastest review I've ever done with any, anybody. Wow. Yeah. So thanks, Mike. Oh, sorry. Let's try that again. So thanks, Michael. Mike is fine. <laughs> uh, You're welcome. Thank you for having uh, me. As I said at the top, Michael is the host of the Merc the Meek podcast. Definitely check it out. There will be a link in the show notes or in the um, YouTube comments uh, below. Um, and everyone, thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed the episode, let us know. If you didn't enjoy the episode, let us know. If you know this product, let me know what you're thinking. And if you have the newer version of this, so Traveler is currently licensed to Mongoose, and they have the newest version of Traveler, and they redid, redid this book as 760 patrons. And wow. I'm, I okay. haven't seen it. I'm very curious, is that actually 760 entries like this? Or is it something weird where it's like 76, but then with 10 options? Or I, I don't know. I just know that they have a product called 760 Patrons. I would love to know what that is. So if you know what it is, let me know. Um, oh, and the other thing I meant to say this during my thing, I think you could have some really neat random tables and duplicate a lot of this book. Anyway, um, yeah, so... Uh, anything you want to say if you're watching on YouTube leave comments in the comment section below if you're listening to the podcast or you just want to send an email it's feedback at decahedron.com spelled decahedron with a K um, if you want to leave voice feedback you can email it just like that or you can call our feedback line it's 562-774-2278 that's 562-RPG-CAST all that is in the show notes below well, it's below if you're on YouTube. I don't know what podcatcher you use. On mine, it's always below. Um, yeah. And there's one other option. It's uh, sayhi.chat slash decahedron. That's to leave voice feedback. If you don't want to make a call, maybe you're overseas or something, but you still want to leave voice feedback. All those will work. Michael, again, thank you very much for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having yeah, me. You were well. awesome. I, I enjoyed it, too. Uh, and everyone, thanks again for watching. And until next time, happy gaming. Happy life. Bye.